Okay, we'll go back to it in a sec. Um, Nicole, sorry, go ahead. My name is Nicole Greenspan. I'm here to represent AIDS Action Now, a group of people concerned about issues related to HIV, hepatitis C, and the health and well-being of marginalized groups in Toronto. I think it's also fitting that um, I'm following a number of speakers who were talking about uh, Jack Layton's legacy and the work he did, in particular for the HIV and AIDS grants. I'm here to comment on the recommendations included in the Toronto Public Health 2012 Operating Budget Request in light of the recently made public Core Services Review final report that will be presented at Executive Committee next week. In this climate of fear, when the Mayor proposes that austerity measures are the only answers to the problems he has determined we have, I am looking to you, the Board of Health, for leadership and a commitment to evidence-based policy and ensuring the health and well-being of this city. At AIDS Action Now, we've been observing what you as a Board of Health has been doing, and we commend you on what you've tried to do. From the documents that are made available to the public, I can see that you've achieved a 10% reduction in the operating budget for 2012 compared to 2011. From what I can tell, you have not proposed any reduction to the sexual health and drug prevention services that are an essential part of what Toronto Public Health provides. However, there are other ways in which crucial HIV and drug prevention work gets carried out that are vulnerable to being cut by the mayor's agenda to reduce the services in this city, particularly the ones that help contain the HIV, syphilis and hepatitis C epidemics. The Community Partnership and Investment Program, which includes the AIDS and Drugs grants that Jack Layton was part of putting together, these are included in the Core Services Review final report with the recommendation that the smaller grants be eliminated. This recommendation is included in a laundry list that includes cuts to affordable housing, childcare, and other vital services. The climate that has been created by the Mayor's agenda and the Core Services Review is a terrifying one, which attempts to divide us and make people fight over ever smaller pieces of the pie. There are currently over 17,000 people living with HIV as residents in Toronto. Many people who have HIV also have hepatitis C. These people come from all different walks of life. They pay taxes, they vote, they live in the suburbs, they live in downtown, they live in the outlying areas, and they invest in this city. Many are from marginalized and disadvantaged communities and face a great deal of difficulties. The services that provide support to these populations are an essential part of support to residents of our city. Investing in the health of people living with HIV, hepatitis C and syphilis is not just about being humane and having compassion. It's also a good investment for our city. There is a wide range of scientific evidence indicating that HIV prevention programs, including needle exchange, are far cheaper than the cost to take care of people who become sick. We know that we are currently containing the HIV epidemic in the City of Toronto. We know we have a syphilis problem that we need to address. We know we have effective evidence-based programs and that we are not running these at a scale which addresses these epidemics more completely. We have seen over the past year that the province is willing to take some of these issues seriously. For example, this past spring, they transferred an additional $100,000 to Toronto Public Health to enhance the response to syphilis. And the mayor was the sole vote opposing this transfer. We know we have these problems and we know we need to maintain or expand our current efforts to respond to them. Why then is the talk at City Hall only about deficits and cuts? Why is the Board of Health not here talking about the need to protect, maintain and expand the vital work we do and the greater investment we still need to make in protecting the health of Torontonians? The conversation we are forced to have because of the Mayor's agenda is the opposite of what we should be talking about. And why isn't the Board of Health more vocal about this? AIDS Action Now is part of a force in this city that is going to make the Mayor's agenda something that cannot be implemented, and especially not quietly. The Mayor says that his core services review recommendations are just scratching the surface of what's needed. I say what is needed is a strong, vocal Board of Health that is willing to take leadership and make sure that the health of marginalized populations and ordinary Toronto citizens is protected. That cutting small grants and programs that help with social determinants of health that drive the HIV epidemic will have negative health impacts and that the city will suffer substantially. You know your constituents will be harmed by the kinds of social service cuts that are being proposed. 
that negative health impacts result from losing these kinds of services. Why are you not more vocal about protecting grants, public housing, child care services, and the like? As a Board of Health, you have an opportunity to show innova innovation, compassion, and fiscal responsibility. As Liz Jansen so evocatively reminded us, on Jack Layton's behalf and in his legacy, it is crucial to carry on the struggle, stand up, and speak out. I urge you to take the opportunities you have as a Board of Health and make sure that the Mayor's political agenda to stop services to our communities is not successful. What we need is more, not less. Please do the right thing. Thank you. Any questions as a deputy? Joe? <coughs> um, from what you know, um, and I, I'm sure you've seen the recommendation from the core services review that the, um, the mayor is proposing to cut any organization that receives less than $10,000 uh -huh. or whose budget is great, is high enough that the, the grant that we give them is less than 5% of their budget. Uh -huh. Um, what impact, from your knowledge from, and from AIDS Action Now, what impact would that have on the um, AIDS and drug prevention community organizations that deal with AIDS, HIV AIDS and uh, drug prevention? So given the publicly available information, it's, we're able to tell how many grants uh, fall below the $10,000 mark, and I think that's either one or two in, in the current funding cycle. Uh, in terms of which programs are funded uh, where the grant makes only 5% of their funding, that's not information that we, we know because we don't know the funding budgets of each of the programs that have been funded. There is the concern that smaller programs and, 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 and sort of po possibly more innovative or more uh, uh, flexible or newer programs that might be smaller would be the, the components that would be cut or it would be the programs cut by this and we would really encourage you that w we need all the money that we're spending doing HIV and drug prevention right now these communities that carry out this work need this support to carry out this work it's Toronto has been a, a model in doing this kind of work and we know that the, the kinds of services that community and the kinds of support that communities need can't be carried out by Toronto Public Health so um, it's hard to, to determine right now which of the actual grants would get cut given this recommendation, but it is a concern that any of it would get cut because this is vital work that needs to be done and in fact it needs to be expanded, right. not just maintained or clipped away at the bottom pieces. Right. And my other question is, is where would you put, um, I, I'm assuming that uh, you're familiar with things uh, HIV AIDS advocacy and frontline work that is happening in let's say a North American or at least a Canadian context would that be fair? I, I hope so. Where would you put Toronto in that at the current moment? Well, Three cuts. I mean when I speak to my when I speak to my friends in Montreal and, and other people they say all they say is how are the cuts going do you have any time for anything else? Um, you know we were we were a model in, in how to carry out this work, right? And, uh, you know, I, I think people are watching our modelship erode. And uh, I think we have, a, I think we've, um, we've lost some passion and some urgency for this issue, and it's not warranted. We still need attention and focus on this, and it's concerning. Okay. Thank you. Alejandra, you had a question? Thanks, Mr. <coughs> Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up Councilor Mahavik's question around the smaller grants. And you talked about how this partnership model and um, that Toronto's famous for has helped to spur innovation. And I'm wondering what you think the impact might be on organizations that work with newcomers. Because um, I think that one of the uh, one of the really excellent things about working in partnership and, and providing grants, from my experience, to community-based organizations is that they can be very responsive to the changing demographics. And, um, you know, immigrant populations in particular who are new, our tenants are very mobile, there's concentrations that are constantly moving around. Yes. And a large institution like Toronto Public Health couldn't necessarily be as responsive 
if it didn't have the mobility of, of working in partnership with smaller organizations, what do you think the impact would be on, on those people that are doubly marginalized by their um, AIDS or HIV status plus their, um, their status within Canada or their years within Canada? So I think the community organizations that we have that have good relationships with vulnerable communities, including new immigrant communities, are the right way to deliver health-related information and services where possible, especially where HIV is concerned because it, it deals with issues related to sexuality, things that happen in the home, um, you know, um, and, and, and controversial issues. And for that information and that, um, that kind of work to be done in communities, languages, where they live, and, and given to them by organizations and agencies that they trust is huge in terms of making the work effective. So small grants that are available to, let's say, newcomer organizations or s settlement are essential because those agencies wouldn't necessarily have the resources or the capacity to be able to do an HIV 101 in the language of their community or distribute condoms or whatever supplies that would be appropriate for that community without an AIDS grant to carry out that work. They need to hire a worker who understands HIV drug use issues as well as the local community, and a small grant is the, the way that, that the, those services could be provided. So I, I mean, I think they're essential. The, the, the epidemic changes, the populations that are affected changes, but there's a continuing marginality that, that people who are affected and infected with HIV experience and we need to be able to keep up with that. We need to be flexible, we need to have our community agencies empowered enough to be able to do the kind of work that needs to get done. Just a, one last question. You talked about this being a model. This way of providing the service, would you say that it's nimble and cost effective? In, 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 compared to having only public health workers do this work, yes, it is more nimble and it is cost effective. The kinds of work that gets done by um, health promoters that are that are that are carried out by this is is tremendous. And um, you know, when you invest in prevention and when you invest in prevention at the community level, you save money because you avert HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis C infections. And those infections and uh, cost us all. Thank you.